Welcome to lecture five on the topic of tactical asset allocation. So last week's lecture looked at strategic asset allocation, which involves identifying the asset classes that an investor uh, wants to hold in order to maximise their utility based on their own personal characteristics and holding that asset allocation for the long term. This week when we look at tactical asset allocation, we look at adopting a more dynamic approach. Tactical al asset allocation involves market timing. That is, predicting future performances across asset classes and dynamically allocating across asset classes based on those predictions. So if you think that um, markets and the, the economy as a whole is going to perform well in the near future, you're going to allocate more of your wealth toward uh, more aggressive, high growth asset classes such as equities, while if you think markets are going to perform poorly, you'll allocate toward defensive asset classes and you shift that asset allocation as your predictions shift. Now, the key benefit of tactical asset allocation relates to the fact we saw last week that between 90 to 97% of variation in fund manager performance can actually be attributed to the asset allocation decision. So given this decision is a key component of the abnormal returns that are attributable to fund managers, if we are able to accurately predict the future directional movements of asset classes and invest accordingly, we should be able to generate significantly uh, positive abnormal returns. However, there are some negatives with this tactical asset allocation approach. First and foremost, evidence suggests that uh, professional fund managers are actually uh, not able to continually predict uh, future movements of various asset classes. Uh, markets tend to be uh, reasonably highly efficient and uh, the investors are not able to uh, make those predictions to the extent that's required to make a significant profit. Some of the other problems with tactical asset allocation will because it is a dynamic strategy, investors will be frequently buying and selling across asset classes, hence incurring significant transaction costs. So an estimate is that in order to just break even when you apply a tactical asset allocation approach, your predictive power in terms of uh, which asset classes are going to perform best and poorest over the future, uh, you need to be accurate at least 7 out of 10 times. So at least 70% of the time. And to be accurate at least 70% of the time, there has to be a fairly large degree of market inefficiency. Another problem with tactical asset allocation is you can actually find yourself getting in and out of the market at the wrong time. So what we find is that Around market turning points, the points where uh, we have significant rallies in, in uh, particular asset classes, uh, for example, if you can think of the global financial crisis in 2008, those periods tend to be accompanied by very high volatility. And if you're trying to time the market, what you might actually find yourself doing is you might, for example, move out of an asset class just as it rebounds. So let's take that example of the GFC. Let's say you're sitting in mid to late 2008, hey, suddenly you decide that um, the equities asset class is not going to perform well. Okay, you might move out in October 2008, which is the, the, uh, the main month, the, the, the largest uh, downward price movement in the equities asset class. However, if you had have stayed out of the equities asset class, even as soon as March, April, May of 2009, what you would have missed is a huge rally, a huge bounce back. And the, the net result would have been that um, although you might have missed the big downturn in, in October 2008, you missed the rally that recuperated a lot of those losses in March, April, May 2009. And you might have found that uh, after incorporating transaction costs, you performed as well or, or maybe even worse than someone who just had a, a long-term buy and hold or a more strategic asset allocation decision. So um, moving in and out of the market at the wrong time uh, can be another problem. The third problem with tactical asset allocation is taxes. We know any investment strategy that results in us buying and selling frequently not only incurs high transaction costs, but also incurs high taxes. So what we're doing is we're realising any capital gains sooner. Uh, so that will mean, for example, we often won't be eligible for the 50% capital gains tax exemption that we receive if we hold a particular asset for 12 months or longer. And because we're realising our uh, capital gains sooner, uh, there's also a time value of money effect where uh, we'll be liable for, for that tax today rather than in the future. 
So while tactical asset allocation maybe has some potential, there are also some significant drawbacks. But it's interesting for us to look at uh, some of the tactical asset allocation signals that are used. Because while there's benefits and weaknesses with tactical asset allocation as a whole, we might find that some of the applications of this approach have more merit than others. So there are three key signals that investors tend to use in order to try to predict the future movement of asset classes. Those signals are sentiment indicators, economic indicators, and technical indicators. So we start with sentiment. We've now moved into a paradigm where market participants uh, fairly uniformly agree that uh, the sentiment of the market as a whole does have some effect on prices. The problem is that sentiment is actually very hard to measure. So how do we actually uh, pick up, how do we quantitatively identify uh, what that sentiment uh, actually is at any particular point in time? A study by Baker and Wergler actually tries to measure sentiment uh, by looking at a whole lot of different market variables, things like the number of IPO issuances, uh, and the particular activities of firms. Uh, and they find that if we uh, break the market up into periods of high and low sentiment, uh, periods of high sentiment are actually also accompanied by higher returns, uh, even after controlling for all other market factors. Uh, other ways that people try to uh, measure market sentiment more recently is by doing text analytics and looking at things like uh, social media sentiment. So this might involve uh, taking the aggregate views of people's Twitter or Facebook posts, uh, bringing that information together, compiling it and coding it, whether uh, they have some relation to uh, views on the economy and whether they're a positive or negative signal. And there's actually evidence that we can distill that information down such that we can get a sentiment indicator that also has some predictive power uh, in terms of the future economy. Now, while that might sound a, you know, quite a large leap of faith, we actually see uh, examples of, of similar sentiment indicators used in popular culture all the time. Uh, just recently, the Triple J Hottest 100, uh, the results were predicted using data that was mined from uh, social media. And what you can see is that's just another example of collecting data based on people's sentiment re relating to some activity and, uh, and, and that information relating to the end result. Economic markets are you know, necessarily no different because a market is just the aggregate of the beliefs and behaviours of individuals. The second type of signal are economic indicators. So, uh, the idea behind using economic indicators to predict market movements is based on the fact that the value of any financial asset should just be the present value of future cash flows. Now, if we look at the value of an asset class as a whole, so let's say we look at the value of the aggregate equity market index, there, in that case, the present value of future cash flows is basically the present value of aggregate corporate profits. And what economic indicators suggest is that we can use business cycle measures to actually predict fluctuations in aggregate corporate profitability and thinking in terms of one of these valuation models that can actually then help us to predict uh, which way that asset class as a whole is going to move. So two of the indicators that are often used, first of all is an aggregate price to earnings uh, measure. So price to earnings uh, on an aggregate basis is the ratio of the aggregate index value divided by aggregate corporate profitability. The idea is when this ratio is very high, current market prices as a ratio to corporate profitability is very high. So that's a time where we might predict that markets are overpriced, so we want to sell that asset class. Whereas when the PE ratio is quite low, uh, that means that it might be an indicator that um, prices are quite low. Second, economic indicator that's been proposed is the uh, yield curve term spread. So this is looking at the difference in the yield between long-term and short-term government bonds. Now if you think back to what you know about corporate finance, expectations theory tells us that a long-term government bond is simply the combination of short-run interest rates across time. Therefore an upward sloping yield curve implies the market uh, has a belief that interest rates are going to, short run interest rates are going to increase in the future. Downward sloping yield curve implies the belief that short run interest rates are going to decrease in the future. Now, the time that short run interest rates decrease tends to be periods of economic slowdowns. So when the market isn't doing well, again, think global financial crisis, central banks often will intervene and will cut interest rates. 
So one interpretation is that a downward sloping yield curve may contain the market belief that uh, in the future there's going to be economic problems which might be resulting in a central bank needing to intervene and reduce interest rates. And consistent with that prediction, there's actually evidence that shows that downward sloping yield curves have predicted every recession in the United States over the past 50 years. Therefore, if we've got this indicator that we can use to predict recessions, we can predict periods when we want to move into and out of uh, highly aggressive assets such as equities. The third tactical asset allocation signal is a technical indicator. And technical indicator is basically uh, the idea that you can use past prices to predict future prices. So the most common application of this is a moving average. If we take the moving average uh, index value from say the last 200 days and we can compare the current index price to that moving average index price, the idea is that when the current index is above the historic average over say the last 200 days, that implies the market is trending upwards and we want to buy. When the current price is below that moving average, it implies the market is trending downwards and we want to sell. So again, this, this technical indicator is based on beliefs that markets are not perfectly efficient. There is that degree of predictability and trends in market indices. But quite interestingly, what we find that at least before transaction costs, this uh, degree of predictability does exist. Now the debate is whether uh, that can actually be converted into profits once we take into account the additional taxes and transaction costs that you will occur through that high level of trading. So that brings us to the obvious. Well, the obvious litmus test for the performance of tactical asset allocation is whether people can make money out of it. So it's important to look at the evidence of the performance of market timers, and unfortunately the evidence does not make for great reading. Over the past 30 years, uh, what we find is that on average, market timing funds or funds that employ tactical asset allocation actually tend to underperform the market on average. So what does this indicate? Well, it indicates to us that while some of the signals we've discussed uh, across this lecture may be relevant and may statistically be able to uh, predict future movements across asset classes, when we impose market friction such as taxes and transaction costs, that statistical pr uh, predictability is eroded and the transaction is not profitable. What this also suggests is that markets are reasonably efficient. So uh, markets are, are sufficiently efficient such that uh, we're not able to easily predict uh, directions of, of future market movements. So the last important point to note is that in recent lectures we've looked at portfolio evaluation. So we've looked at the importance of assessing the performance of a particular portfolio as a way of measuring the effectiveness of an investment strategy. And what we looked at in that lecture is the importance of looking at risk-adjusted portfolio returns. Well, now we've seen that uh, an investor makes two decisions, asset allocation and security selection. It becomes obvious that if we're trying to assess the performance of a fund and a fund manager, we should disaggregate between their performance in terms of asset allocation and their performance in terms of security selection. And that's what portfolio attribution does. So with portfolio attribution, we identify a benchmark portfolio. And that benchmark portfolio will both have weights across asset classes, so it'll have a benchmark asset allocation decision, and it will also have a benchmark index return, so that will give us a benchmark for our security selection decision. And what we do is we compare our, we, we break down our total overall alpha, whether that be positive or negative, and we disaggregate it in terms of identifying what proportion of that alpha is, is due to asset allocation and what proportion of our alpha is due to security selection. Now, a very important point to note with portfolio attribution is that it is only as good as the benchmark we use. So we do need a relevant and reliable benchmark in order for us to get an accurate prediction of the uh, aggregated performance of asset allocation and security selection. So that's our summary of Topic 5, Tactical Asset Allocation. Thanks for listening.